Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to AI Curate Webinar Specials CXO Series. It's a privilege to have Lalita Huja with us today to discuss on the topic, the future of global capability centers, strategic approaches. This session will be moderated by Samir Dhanrajani, CEO and co-founder AI Curate Advisory and Consulting. Before we start the session, let's set some uh, housekeeping rules. Please be on mute for uninterrupted webinar. Leave your, <laughs> leave your questions in the chat window. So we will pick those up for Q&A. This webinar is being <laughs> Sorry, can you mute, please? Thank you. This webinar is being recorded and you may check the playback video on our website, www.aicurate.ai. I would like to introduce uh, Lalit. Lalit is the CEO of ANSR Consulting Incorporations, the global leader in establishing and operating global capability centers. Since its inception, ANSR has established over 50 GCCs, aggregating to 65,000 FTE positions with over 1.5 billion US dollars in capital investments. Lalit has also served as Chairman and President of Target India, GCC Leadership Board positions with Lois, AB InBev, L Brands, JCPenney, HBC, Delta Airlines, and Asina Retail. He was also CEO of India's India Limited, now a Cisco company. CEO of News Corporation India, Star TV, and News Corporation Corporate Venture Fund. He was CEO of LG Electronics in India. He was CEO of Datamatics Limited Mumbai and was Senior Executive Advisor for Distribution Sector IBM Japan. Lalit started his career in the Indian Navy before retiring as Lieutenant Commander. While in the Navy, he was the head of the prestigious Naval Computer Application Center in Lonaula and was Senior Engineer Officer at INS Vindhagiri and INS Shakti has an MS in Computer Science from IIT Bombay and an engineering degree from BITS Pilan. Thanks, Lalit, for booking time to be in our webinar specials today. I will now hand over the session to Samir. Samir, over to you. Thanks, NK, for the introductions. And uh, Lalit, it's a pleasure to have you at AI Curate webinar special CXO series. And I must say, uh, while had a whole detailed out uh, profile of yours that doesn't do justice uh, having known you from uh, quite some time i think uh, it's really kind of commendable to see how ansr has really built a very specific kind of let's say segment what i call a very pivotal segment gcc uh, and 50 gcc set up conceptualizing scaling up building uh, is is by no means a small feat. So congratulations, and uh, it's it's really great to have you at our uh, session. Thank you, Lala, just to get set the ball rolling, uh, and I'll start with something which I think is uh, ailing everyone. Suddenly, last three months have been a kind of a tipsy turvy for everyone. While everyone was talking about 2020, they came out with whole ones blazing in terms of the strategic plans, but cut to June 2020, pandemic, unprecedented times, and this whole economic scenario has really shifted us to really cogitate and think in terms of what's happened. Now, on the other side, GCC has been kind of going great guns in terms of a fantastic story in India, and that's been pivotal in terms of how Today, they've added a lot of value, a lot of kind of, let's say, appeal in terms of uh, uh, kind of, let's say, not only being a kind of a mirror for the parent organization, but also a very kind of a pivotal aspect of bringing transformation and innovation for overall segment. Having said that, first thing which I would like to take your opinion would be more about what has changed in the last few months? What happened? I mean, this whole notion of GCC where we were taking a leap in terms of the next level suddenly seems to be hitting a pause. And also in terms of the current existing GCCs, I think there is a spate of activities which is going on. So it would be great to kind of 
highlight what's the current situations and what's happened in the last few months which you believe will be a kind of really a reflective point for GCCs in terms of how they operate, whether it's their talent or their kind of infrastructure or even their operations. Uh, thank you, Samir. Uh, you know, just building on some of the comments you made, I think we are in the middle of an unprecedented global health, safety, and economic crisis, the, uh, which will have a profound impact on just about everything, not just GCCs. And, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, the impact of this crisis from three different dimensions. Obviously, there is a huge economic impairment, uh, and that is because the customers have disappeared, the businesses have slowed down, shut down, uh, have, dis have just gone away, have been decimated. The second is the notion of time lapse you know, for three months or who knows, another three months, uh, it's almost like someone's pressed the pause button. You know, airlines are not flying, hotel rooms are not being booked, uh, malls are shut, retailers are not selling. So there is a pause, you know, which adds a very interesting dimension. It could be as uh, trivial as uh, the point of sale systems in many of the stores would require uh, extensive maintenance before you can switch them on and put them to work if they remain shut for some more time, right? I mean, there can be uh, a number of similar examples of what the time lapse is gonna do to not just economic activity, but in terms of what does it take to get the business back to normal. The third is uh, an interesting impact and this is about what bounce back or recovery is going to look like, right? And there are all kinds of theories out there, U-shaped recovery, a W-shaped recovery. Uh, but in the concept, in the context of GCCs, uh, we are predicting a Y-shaped recovery, right? With the two forks uh, being the recovery or bounce back to business as usual. And the other folk representing the new normal as we all know, right? And that'll mean every business in some ways is gonna change. If it is a bank, it'll be more online and digital payments. If it is a manufacturing company with the impact of social distancing and possibly a broken supply chain, uh, you know, the throughput is gonna be impacted, right? If it is a retailer, uh, possibly it's going to be a lot more e-commerce or omni-channel, right? Um, and, and I think that this, this Y-shape impact is, you know, uh, or recovery is making organizations think through what the other side of this pandemic is going to look like, right? More focused on the new normal, which will mean different things to different countries, different industries, different companies. And I guess that's where the GCCs will play a very, very important role in terms of, uh, you know, driving the relevancy and the survival agenda of their host companies. Um, this is in some ways a point of inflection for the GCCs. You know, last three years, we've seen a movement of sorts. We had the captives, Rechristened as GICs, GCCs. There was a very strong conversation around uh, GCCs becoming GTCs this year. If the NASCOM GCC conclave would have been held, uh, there was a very strong opinion about, you know, uh, sunsetting the concept of GCC and uh, using the term GTC as a reflection of the ability of these uh, centers to transform enterprises, so global transformation centers. And there was also this prophecy around diminishing distance between the GCC and the enterprise, right? So the theory is come 2021, 2022 max, uh, the GCC would be the enterprise. They won't be the outposts anymore. Uh, they won't be the, the back office or that remote location, but they'll be the mainstream enterprise. 
I guess for many companies with you know properly established GCCs, and we can talk more about what that phrase means. Um, you know, GCCs are now the front end center of the recovery, the bounce back, uh, the new normal alignment strategy. And it can mean several things. Uh, GCCs would be trusted capacity that the companies would need to uh, do more, to you know, make up uh, for the time lapse or the economic impairment or to build you know, systems or technologies uh, to align with the new normal. Um, and uh, at the same time, the companies would double down on certain technologies that were already mainstream, but we'll see a lot more, you know, on the other side, for example, digital transformation, you know, bulk of the IT budgets are now going to go into more digital. So there's going to be more, you know, data insights, more digital, more cloud, the examples of companies that, you know, were not able to, you know, efficiently access data centers because of the restrictions in movement, right? So, uh, you know, which obviously makes a much stronger case for, you know, cloud transformation. So I guess the notion of being a lower cost option, trust, the ability to quickly align with an evolve or a changing enterprise agenda, the ability to build new business capabilities, um, you know, would obviously make it uh, an interesting uh, time for the GCCs. I mean, in some ways, think of GCCs as being the uh, operating model of the moment. So, Lala, that's a great uh, rendition what you talked about, and specifically uh, from your narrative. I picked up two points. Uh, one was this inflection points of GCCs, and the second, this whole progressional genre change, which is in terms of GCC, right? from the days of being a cost arbitrage center to today, almost mimicking uh, the enterprise or the parent organization. And I'll come to uh, kind of uh, seek your, uh, I would say perspectives on this whole aspect of mirroring the enterprise. Specifically on this inflection point of GCC, Lalit, I want to take your views. Uh, one of the main aspect about this GCCs have always been an emphasis on talent multi-dimensional, multifarious, extremely high pedigree of talent and very, very inclusive. Now, suddenly with this pandemic, we're talking about a whole aspect where no one ever thought about this remote, remote work management on a largish basis. We are talking about VPN connections being set up. We are talking about onboarding. We are talking about talent acquisition. Now, and you, you work with multiple GCCs and all. Do you first of all see this whole aspect of talent in a new avatar altogether for GCCs, or you believe there will be some more best practices which will be established in terms of talent aspect for GCCs? Yeah, so I think in some ways GCCs are all about talent, and I think this is one area that is going to see profound changes, right? And uh, you know, traditionally GCCs have represented a very rigid uh, manifestation of an employee's desire to access global talent. And what that rigidity meant was obviously, you know, setting up a legal entity that in uh, countries like India is not easy to sort of bring down. Uh, you're hiring employees and as much as you're hiring them uh, on a work to hire basis, uh, the fact remains or that um, there's a reputational impact if you were to, you know, uh, take any workforce reduction or an extreme step that involves laying off employees. And the third piece has to do with the infrastructure, whether it's real estate or IT. The IT infrastructure is typically over-engineered. The uh, GCCs mirror the global offices. And, uh, you know, in our world, you have to make long-term commitments to, you know, have a respectable real estate footprint, right? So a lot of this is going to change because what has the many myths that this pandemic has busted, you know, work can be done productively, efficiently, 
from anywhere, not just work from home, work from rem remote, right? You could be in Mysore, you could be in Krakow, Poland, or you could be sitting anywhere and you can, you know, uh, where you're located does not suddenly matter anymore, right? People are more accessible, time zone differences have disappeared. Nobody talks about business continuation anymore. And uh, we're seeing in some ways, you know, uh, other manifestations of GCCs from a talent perspective coming up. For example, companies desiring to just hire people, you know, think of talent on cloud, you know, and just a validation of the emergence of the gig economy. Uh, and you don't have the office and you don't have the legal entity, but people work where they live or they could be in Timbuktu for that matter. And they are serving the needs of a company, right? So, uh, and of course, at some point, this will all fall into place into what we know of GCCs as today, but we'll see a lot of virtual GCCs coming up, right? So I guess we're moving in a direction of virtualization of work, virtualization of operating model, virtualization of talent. And this will also open out, you know, obviously lots of opportunities for people who would want to work differently, right? I mean, work for fewer hours, work in wherever they stay or wherever they want to stay instead of, you know, being in uh, locations where the GCCs are typically sort of cited, right? So this is the beginning of um, a very big change when it comes to uh, talent. Everything else in a GCC are the wrappers that you put around talent, right? Uh, to ensure that they get experiential and immersive uh, kind of an environment to collaborate and to, to do the work. But when talent goes on cloud, and gets virtualized, it will just open the floodgates because a lot of companies were essentially not able to do GCCs because of the reputational risk associated with hiring employees, because of the capital investment required in setting up the infrastructure. And of course, the whole notion of employing employees in uh, you know, countries that you know, you're not very comfortable with or you know so little about, right? So, so Lalit, if I may, and I'm sorry to chime in, but you brought two very interesting aspects and I want your uh, opinion over there as well. One is this piece around if you are saying that, look, maybe this is a new model of GCCs in terms of having the talent work from homes or remote locations. The fact over there over the years has been a great trust has been put in terms of cultural affiliations. I mean, a lot of investments have gone by GCCs in terms of saying, look, I mean, we want to breathe, have the talent breathe and exude that culture, what the enterprise is all about. Now, one, what happens when it's a question in terms of majority of the workforce working remotely? And the second, which is just to peel the onion is about culture aside. Now, this whole aspect of in for security, the data not being shared, and some of these risk mitigation factors which needs to be coming in. Do you foresee that this will be a kind of immediate, kind of a let's say strategy for the GCCs to come out with the best practices, or you believe it will evolve over the years? I think to an extent, the playbook is already out there, right? So you know, literally within you know days and couple of weeks of the pandemic starting and the writing being on the wall that this means rest of the year gone until some sort of a permanent cure is there. People started working on, you know, what the other side is going to look like. As I said, GCCs are going to be virtualized. We are actually talking of a few companies that, you know, as early as next two weeks would be establishing virtual GCCs. There are some complex tax uh, and benefits administration issues that have to be resolved. But other than that, I mean, the concept is very, very appealing, right? So which essentially means that you, you have lowered the bar or the hurdles for someone to come to India and experiment with a different model 
altogether. At some point, they would catch up with the traditional view of a GCC. An extreme view uh, or the other side of the spectrum is what happens to the massive over-engineered infrastructure that the GCCs invest in, you know, real estate, the office space, IT infrastructure. And here's how you got to look at it, right? So, I mean, obviously we see a lot of product companies like Twitter and our own TCS talking about people largely working out of home. Uh, we're not going to see a whole lot of that out of GCCs. I guess where the pendulum is going to swing a little bit on the right in terms of a lot more flexibility that people will be offered in terms of working remotely, right? And which still means that you're expected to come to office for culture days, for teaming, for town halls, for that immersion, for that experience, right? To, you know, rejuvenate yourself, to re-energize yourself. So, you know, a lot of new GCCs that are being established in the, the post COVID-19 uh, period are in fact over investing in the infrastructure, bigger offices, amenities that were never thought of earlier to allow people to uh, get together in a more safe and socially distanced way, which is gonna be the norm, even if there was a vaccine of sorts, conference rooms will be bigger, there'll be a lot more space that will be allocated per capita. Uh, so the office stays. Uh, the other part is obviously what happens to the IT infrastructure. So you know, traditionally GCCs always invested in the right uh, end user computing infrastructure, uh, you know, the security, uh, you know, systems in terms of remote access, just about everybody you know, accesses systems, takes calls, you know, remotely and, you know, info security was something which uh, most GCCs had already addressed. We'll see companies doubling down on it. You know, you'll get not only more, you know, powerful hardware, but uh, we already know of a number of companies that give a UPS with it, are giving you an ergonomic chair. And if you have place in your house, maybe you also get a table that goes with it so you can be efficient. I guess there's a lot of work in terms of um, policies, uh, not only because you're working remotely and the implications on info security and how do you drive, you know, that extra accountability for the fact that, you know, data has gone out of the confines of an office to your home but it's all in the works, right? So some of the GCCs that are in the, pro in the process of being established, you know, the, uh, the COVID-19 babies are all geared up for, uh, you know, uh, an enhanced VPN infrastructure, you know, security tokenization, use of, you know, bots to enable access to uh, systems remotely, so it uh, it is a no-brainer in that sense. And of course, you know, offices that look very, very different. So the point I'm trying to make is there would be a significant qualitative improvement in the work the GCCs would do. There would be a lot more acceptability in terms of the work being done remotely, but with a requirement for people to come office and to you know benefit from what a gcc is all about and of course uh, you know the strengthening of you know policies that relate to largely info security great great one aspect lalit and uh, this is interesting what you said and i'm sure the participants will have a lot of takeaways uh, from this uh, narrative one of the facets you touched about gig workers. Now today, there's an article in Economic Times, one of the uh, business dailies in India, which talks about in the fast forward future, most of the IT bellwether companies will have 35% of their workforce as gig workers. What do you see in the GCCs on the gig worker side? Because uh, it's not that prevalent so far, but do you see that winds of change happening on the gig worker side? or you believe it will be a status quo uh, 
particularly for GCCs? Yeah, I think somewhere uh, it was always there, right? We were beginning to see people who just wanted to work differently, right? And uh, and the reason why they couldn't do it effectively was because this was not a proven model. I mean, the whole notion of work being taken away from the office and being done with productivity was not something that many companies could kind of come to terms with, right? I think what the pandemic has done has changed it all, right? Not only uh, this works, but any kind of work can be done or most kind of work can be done. Obviously, you cannot do a store associates work or a you know, banker's job sitting remotely, but just about everything that's an HQ job can now be done sitting out of your home. So that's one part of it. The second is, uh, you know, how people look or feel about it, right? And then, of course, uh, like everything else, there are, you know, different views, but largely a lot of people feel, hey, you know, this works, right? I mean, and this will have several connotations. One, uh, you know, the fact that many of them will, you know, proactively look out for opportunities that allow them to, you know, work at their own convenience of their homes or wherever they're comfortable in. Uh, the, pick and choose the time, not be, uh, you know, uh, constrained by travel infrastructure. I mean, we've all seen a lot of productivity. We also know some of it is not very sustainable. I mean, you do want, you know, the infusion of what the word of office and culture and learning and developmental interventions were all about, right? So, so I guess uh, where the gig economy is going to come to life is, you know, the fact that there is going to be adoption and acceptability by companies uh, as the infrastructure, info security policies, some of the regulatory tax issues, you know, we'll have to relook at a shops and establishment act, some of the SEC related issues in terms of what happens if, you know, now production is happening out of homes. But I guess from a Workforce perspective, we'll see increasingly more people coming into the gig economy, going to cloud because they think it worked. They were they are healthy, they are less stressful, they got a much better work-life balance. But we also have people who didn't have the right infrastructure because they just didn't have the right home, right, to be uh, taking advantage of. Some of them will make those investments. And some of them obviously will come back to, you know, what the environment uh, was before COVID-19. But the fact remains uh, that gig economy is here to stay. And it will, it is truly on cloud. We are actually setting up our first virtual GCC. And we have people joining us from seven countries. Right? Wow. Uh, and many of them will remain but travel occasionally to Bangalore for that immersion, for the teaming, for those real town. But you know, you can make up for those budgets uh, given the fact that there'll be less investment in certain areas. Now this is a different kind of a gig economy, right? Because this is the, the global gig economy, you know, that can be put to work in very, very interesting ways. And this company comes up as early as next three weeks so, you know, literally four months into the pandemic, you have uh, a gig GCC, you know, call it the GGGC, you know, coming up. I think it's heartening to know that while the world is still struggling to come out with the models and the new kind of operating rhythm, I mean, there is already a kind of a way forward approach for something which I think to me would be a new template and you very, uh, incisively put across this aspect about uh, how the gig workers can actually blend very well with the GCC. So great, great uh, narrative. Switching gears, Lalit, I want to spend some time with you on two facets. One, of course, the GCC leadership uh, thing, but the first uh, piece is something which you also said in your earlier part of narrative. Uh, exponential technologies, digital transformation. Now, suddenly over the last few years, we've seen a spate of momentum around GCC spending 
a great and significant part in terms of uh, becoming more like innovation and transformation hubs for their uh, enterprises and parent organizations. Having said that, there's always a pivot which is across how do you measure this whole innovation and transformation? And you interact with many senior executives, CXOs from large organizations, and many of them have, uh, have their GCCs out here. From the lens, if I just put you in that particular sphere, what is that they see in terms of the value? What is the aspect about measuring the whole impact or the value creation from their side when it comes to building these innovation and transformation hubs for the parent and the enterprises? So, you know, innovation is beginning to uh, become real as we started innovating around innovation, right? Uh, and essentially what that meant was, how do you connect the dots between innovation and the business outcomes that you can influence? And the second was to contextualize innovation, you know, for a specific, you know, nuance, a specific company, a specific situation so you know uh, some of the challenges with innovation was this whole notion of vanilla innovation you know just because there's automation it doesn't mean there is a place and room for it in an organization you've got to have the right use cases so if you have a problem statement and if you can find an innovative solution for it that results in a business outcome you know that is where it all sort of comes together Right, and I guess um, what's happened over the last uh, few weeks and what continues to happen is again, the ability of organizations to sort of revive, to bounce back in a highly constrained manner, right? Broken supply chains, the workforce is in a, is in a disarray. Uh, certain systems don't work because, you know, there are bits and pieces of the platforms that have just disappeared in, in some ways. And also the fact that for many companies, what worked was, was digital in some form or the other, whether it was a bank, whether it was a hotel, whether it was uh, you know, an education company or a retailer, you know, it was online that uh, saved the day, right? So I guess two parts to what I'm trying to say over here. One is the impact of some of the exponential technologies from digital to data to AI is something which has been validated, in certain cases, stress tested. And therefore, there is going to be a demand for you know, doubling down, accelerating. And companies that didn't make it or are struggling are the ones that did not have the right capabilities in some of these areas, right? And therefore, whether you were there or you were, you didn't have the right capabilities, uh, this is a big part of the agenda. You know, everything around exponential technologies. Uh, and the second uh, part or the other side of the coin is, how can you put it to work in a manner that will uh, result in the bounce back that will result in, uh, you know, making up for the impairment that has happened. So, for example, we see a lot of talk about automation in a very different way. You're talking of specific problem cases, uh, you know, that can be solved by RPA. So, the big shift from experimenting with some of these exponential technologies to actually, you know, using them to resolve or neutralize a real problem that exists uh, today, right? And that is gonna be the big shift when it comes to embracing or adoption of exponential technologies by the GCCs is concerned. You'll have to couple them with real problems and take the responsibility accountability for demonstrating, you know, outcomes, sales, uh, conversion, or, you know, repair to the supply chain or any other aspect that sort of matters to the company. 
bit of tangential uh, lalat sticking but sticking to the same point what you said now works beautifully for the gccs which have been able to set up their operations in a couple of years at best they've been existing very large gccs with scale today in india now for them this dual mandate of scaling as well as ensuring that they're up on the innovation and transformation is a double edged sword what do you think over there is there a kind of a, let's say secret sauce of managing scale and innovation transformation or you believe they have to hedge against each other or there's something else which you believe is something which could be a kind of a strategic differentiator in terms of how they maintain the relevance in the time to come yes that's an interesting question and i think the problem here is that uh, you know we use the term gccs for a very wide spectrum of operating models right uh, you can have a twitter or you can have an uber or parts of amazon you know building their next generation system and you can have a, a gcc that was or that closely resembles and replicates a third party service provider right it was set up for scale and set up to provide cost arbitrage you know quantitatively you know from my uh, perspective gccs have always been a qualitative play or should be a qualitative play right i mean they are overlays on the enterprise to you know build capabilities at scale that otherwise you know uh, is not possible because of you know scarcity of talent uh, in you know many parts of the world right it doesn't mean you don't get the scale and the quantitative dimensions to it but i guess it all depends where you start you know not very long ago there was this whole notion of versioning of gccs 1.0 last year we were 5.0 if i was to look at some of the gccs that will come up in july august i think there will be 7 or 8 or 9.0 assuming 10.0 is the enterprise then you stop calling them as gccs or gtcs you just call them as the company they are part of right because they become the the so enterprise. for some and I, and i'm chiming in because it's so interesting what you said for someone who's already a 2.0 or 3.0 what does it take for them and I'm, of course i'm talking about the existing ones what does it take for them to be on this higher on the curve in terms of being 7 or 8 yeah and and there's an interesting way of looking at it if you look at companies like walmart and target and you know airlines uh, we recently started working for a regional grocery retailer uh, in us that had established uh, an innovation hub in the silicon valley right we all aware of many companies that essentially put an arm or a small capability and you know innovation hot beds to essentially take advantage of you know uh just getting a sense of what's going on right so i guess to move a 2.0 to uh 7.0 is a herculean task right i mean you got to you know resurrect or change the entire foundation yes uh what is the possibility and we are actually working on you know two uh sort of gccs that are going from 1.0 and 2.0 to 7.0 with by creating small teams that are almost like uh newer manifestations of what a gcc should be all about right i mean where gccs are or should be today is closer to the enterprise functional or global leaders uh accountability for business outcomes you know obviously everything culture and values because that's the heart and soul of it you know innovation and transformation and if you are truly a gcc you are on top of the stack because you are essentially building capabilities to future proof you know these organizations so what these companies are doing are setting up you know teams part of their 
existing organizations, separate subsidiaries, separate cities, separate locations, separate floor that just behaves differently, right? And the hope is that uh, as they mature and as they become impactful from an organization perspective, they start impacting the rest of the organization, right? So I guess three choices here. You know, take a two auto and try and become a seven auto, right? Not gonna happen, or it's gonna be very, very difficult if uh, you were, if you have the scale. Uh, two, uh, take a two auto and create a seven auto, which is a smaller team focused on digital, you know, working with startups, doing AI work, and you may be doing FPNA or financial accounting or HR or testing kind of work in the 2.0 kind of a mode. Uh, and that's the second where you have two ends of the spectrum. And the third is, of course, you do these two ends and at some point they'll meet, you know, you take a little bit of bottoms up and top down and progressively, you know, change the entire organization. But I guess uh, something needs to be done in terms of moving the two dotos and three dotos up the value chain. You know, given the fact that there are truly inspiring stories out there of GCCs that are possibly the most important uh, part of the organization. You know, we were putting a number the other day on the quantum of business that the five dotos are running uh, for global enterprises. And the number was staggering $550 billion, right? So think about ownership of $550 billion of business, right, from some of these GCCs, directly in many cases and indirectly in many cases, but they play an important role in the realization of that very, very big number. Right, so that's an astounding number—550 billion dollars. Wow! Yes. And, and I think that's where ultimately you got to see uh, these entities taking that ownership uh, of, you know, revenues today, valuation tomorrow, because you're creating that uh, that incredible value that is otherwise so uh, difficult to create. Right. So I think with everything happening. Uh, we'll see the mainstreaming of GCCs. What happened to outsourcing 20 years back will now happen to GCCs because the bars lowered. You can set up a GCC with no capital, with no legal entity, with remote virtual teams by tapping into the gig economy because work can be done productively anywhere or any work can be done anywhere. Wonderful. I think that's fascinating, Lalit, what you said, because maybe this is the new next in terms of how GCs will not only be conceptualized, but they will operate. And that also gives a lot of nuggets of recommendations for the existing GCCs, how they should not only resurrect or pivot, but also move incrementally up the value chain. Uh, great, great perspective. Switching gears on the GCC leadership, Lalit, that's been an area I think not very often talked about and maybe you're the right person uh, uh, to give this uh, kind of let's say viewpoint. I mean, just on these aspects about sea level advocacy, uh, ecosystem building, managing matrix kind of a let's say environment in terms of relationships with the enterprise, uh, capacity building uh, until it was recently, I mean, before it got changed, the whole aspect about then bringing that ecosystem in terms of collaboration, partnerships, corporate governance. And there's a lot which a GCC leaders goes through. So first on this aspect, would love to take your opinion. Is that enough or you see some new attributes, strategic operational, which are coming in, which changes the whole performance vectors for the GCC leaders? Lalit, sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I said that the, all the changes we've seen over the past four or five years and the more important the changes that we'll see in the, the months and years ahead, I guess the opportunity was never as big as it is today. I mean, we have mandates to actually hire CIOs and CTOs for companies 
to be based out of GCCs, right? What it means is we need leaders who would now uh, play on the global canvas, uh, which means a lot more than what our leaders have been have been doing uh, uh, so far. Uh, given the fact that most of the GCCs are top of the stack, are uh, driving or at least have the opportunity to drive the future proofing and relevancy agenda for these enterprises in, and in current environment. Uh, many of them have the opportunity to accelerate and to influence the recovery of their companies, right? And uh, this requires a very different kind of leadership altogether, right? Because not only it requires a lot more agility and resiliency, but also the leadership dimensions in terms of how do they build an ability to influence the rest of the organization, the C-suite, uh, to have, you know, coming in. Um, the notion of agility and flexibility comes because the changes are going to be very, very rapid, right? Uh, because, you know, the decimation was, uh, you know, literally in three months, some companies have gone from 100 to five, right? In terms of their revenues pre-COVID, right? So therefore, uh, you know, they would have a desire to bounce back very rapidly. And this is where we come back to the notion of trusted capacity, GCC leadership, where, you know, you have to now, you know, rise up, align uh, with the enterprise priorities, understand where the issues and challenges are and deliver above and beyond to, you know, lift up the entire enterprise, right? And, uh, and I think that's where, uh, you know, we would uh, have a need for, you know, very different leadership dimensions in the post COVID-19 era, if we have to, you know, make the best out of the opportunities companies are providing to their GCCs. In your spot, uh, if I ask you in your opinion, the top three attributes, what a GCC leader from now on should have, what would those be? I think resiliency, uh, the, uh, the flexibility for from a realignment perspective, things change, right? Our traditional leadership has been rather inflexible, rigid. So therefore, uh, adoption of new operating model, new technologies, new way of working, gig economy, innovation, transformation, everything that we talk and profess, the time to act on it is, is now. Uh, the third would be the ability to influence, in most cases, without authority, right? The influencing yeah. ability, because you have the horsepower, you have the means, you have uh, examples, inspiring stories. Uh, if somebody else is doing it, I mean, how can you influence your own organization to bring that work or to take on that responsibility and accountability. If I have to add a fourth, it'll be just that whole notion of being a lot more accountable. You know, accountable for outcomes, accountable KPIs, accountable for, you know, how they can drive or change their, their organization. I mean, this, we never had this opportunity. I mean, there's one bright side of this pandemic for all of us in the GCC world, it is the time is now to, you know, to pick up the threads and there are so many of them that we can run with. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll also take some questions and, but one uh, question I had blend with the question is also about this facet, what you touched upon exponential technologies, digital transformation, AI, ML being in the front. Now, the fact over there, as we know, talent is in deficit and these capabilities are hard to build. Now, there is a convergence uh, happening where the bellwether IT organizations, consulting companies have also opened up GCC as a segment where they want to cater to. So on the other side, GCC are also looking 
and saying, look here, maybe it's difficult for us to say, look, we can do it on our own. First of all, do you see this convergence happening? And I have to blend the question also. In this whole landscape and the milieu of uh, uh, GCCs, third parties, startups, do you anticipate in the time to come some mergers and acquisitions and some corporate investments happening in this entire landscape? Sorry, I'm just trying to layer it up, but I just want to vary with the question as well. Yeah, I think the word on the other side is going to be uh, a potpourri, a hybrid of many different operating models, you know, with the lines getting blurred, right? If you have to really put something together, you need some competent, accountable, capable employees that are driven by purpose, that know what needs to be done. You need to bring in some capacity from the service providers. You need to tap into the gig economy because there is a lot of talent or there would be a lot of talent that would just want to work very, very differently, right? So I guess uh, in the whole area of workforce transformation, there is a lot of innovation, you know, waiting to happen, waiting to unfold. And uh, companies that will succeed are the ones who would be very open to the hybridization of, you know, different operating models. You know, today it's one extreme versus the other. You outsource, you insource, you have GCC, you have a service provider or you have some staff org. I guess this whole mix and match and, you know, putting together the dream team that can deliver very quickly on what needs to be done is going to be the way forward. And we, I, I can tell you, we have many great examples where this is being brought to life in incredible ways. So one one additional point over there, on which I want to take your feedback. Have the third party players, consulting organizations figured out how they need to do the GCCs in terms of stepping up to the capabilities, or you believe they are still there in the game, but they are not still mature. What's what's your thought over there? So I'm trying to understand this question better, but I think uh, because of the nuances of our industry, we make these um, comparisons between third party and GCC. I mean, this has been life ever since the first GCC was formed, right? I mean call it rivalry, call it, um, you know, dominance for, you know, the business opportunity. But I think it's a, it's a wrong comparison to be doing. I mean, you don't go to US and compare an Accenture with Target, right? Anybody who works in Target's headquarters in Minneapolis uh, does not, uh, you know, compare with Accenture and vice versa. But in India, because you have, you know, one, common fluid talent pool, you know, we make these comparisons on what is better. And as we get past the 5.0, 7.0, GCC becoming enterprise, you know, many GCCs are now HQ2 with global leaders sitting over here. Uh, some of these conversations and therefore practices are going to cease. The service providers will see GCC as an enterprise, as a customer as you know, an opportunity to collaborate and come out with newer operating models. We are beginning to see some of that happen today. And when that sort of gets formed in a more sustainable kind of a manner, I can tell you that uh, you know, this would be a very different uh, landscape altogether. Because today, a lot of it is around you know, one versus the other, and it is really not about that. Wonderful. And this one is interesting, Lalit, in terms of questions that largely GCCs have been working below their radar. They don't often talk about their body of work and remain insulated. First of all, do you agree? And if that's what some of the GCCs do, do you think this is the right way or maybe there is a kind of a different shift uh, which will happen in the time to come? you thought over there and th this is a direct question but i thought it's better to go over back on this yeah and i think this is right i completely agree with it in fact the better the gcc the more stealth it is right mm -hmm. and and that is because it uh, exhibits or reflects the characteristics or properties of 
the parent company? I mean, how much do you hear about what's going on in a Walmart and Amazon or a Apple or a, you know, any GCC you pick up, right? Or any company you pick up. Companies don't talk about the work they do. This is competitiveness. This is, you know, putting all your cards on the table. So, you know, GCCs that are in some ways not fully there as GCCs, because if you are the enterprise, you're not supposed to be, you know, getting the word out there, right? And that is the nature of how companies work. And, uh, and that's why uh, a lot about GCCs is an untold story, right? Some of the best uh, inspirational work will never come out. And so, I mean, you and I have spoken in the past in terms of, you know, some of the deepest tech centers, I mean, some of the most sophisticated tech capabilities being hosted by, you know, unimaginable sort of companies, you know, that have a GCC. You know, sometimes it could be, you know, a, an apparel retailer uh, that, you know, will give some like Google a run for money in terms of the, the quality of work that happens. No one will ever know about it. It's not supposed to be spoken because when that work comes to life, it'll be competitive advantage for a company, right? So companies don't, they just don't want to talk about it, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, and that's why you don't see too many case studies or, you know, some of the GCC conferences, you know, just broad brush, you know, the, the good work that happens. So completely agree and don't have a good answer to it. But, uh, you know, whenever we do some work, we sign up for keeping our mouth shut. <laughs> Lalit, uh, we are at the top of the hour, but must say, uh, I was listening very uh, kind of, let's say, uh, with the rapt attention, uh, engrossing, riveting, absorbing, and very engaging because uh, the fact, first of all, it's not very often we talk very strategically on the GCC as a model, as a construct, as an operating kind of a structure. And the fact that the dimensions, paradigms, what you mentioned, uh, anecdotally also in terms of how the whole play has been shuffled with this pandemic has been very, very, I would say, uh, game because you also said that it's not going to stop. It will kind of take its own kind of a course in terms of a new model and a new template emerging. And the version aspect, what you said, is something which I just want to tell our global audience that uh, there would be a second series of Lalit coming in again. And I respect his time because uh, uh, from 5.30 in the morning India time to almost like 10.30, 11 at night, uh, maybe much beyond, he's on the calls and uh, in the meetings. But we will do a second session where uh, more importantly, we'll talk about what this aspect about GCCs becoming enterprises in the time looks like and much more things but lalit thank you so much it's been a pleasure and honor to have you for this session really appreciate appreciate your insights and viewpoints and all the best for answer in the time to come thank you so much thanks everyone thank you bye-bye thanks everyone bye, -bye. bye, -bye.